Uh, hi, it's Ben Nicholson, the uh, author of Clockwork Basilisk. And today uh, we're with my dear friend, Donald Bates, who's the chair of the architecture and design program at the University of Melbourne. We've known each other for over 40 years. And I've asked him to, mm, dare I say, tear me apart for uh, uh, pr probably fleeing the uh, realm of architecture and entering into the realm of uh, firearm history and design. So Don, great to see you. Good We've known each you. other for 45 years. And, and so we just look at each other, we start blinking. <laughs> Something like that. Now look, I, I, I've subscribed to the book. I can't wait till it's published and is out and available. It's, uh, I've been following it for some time now, and particularly some of the videos that you've already done. And I'm really just in a great anticipation to actually see the book. But the question I would have for you is, yes, we studied architecture together at our master's degree at Cranbrook Academy of Art. You went on to teach in Houston and back in Chicago and various places. You have a long history as an architectural educator. And then you got fascinated with guns, or maybe you'd always been fascinated. <laughs> so the question came for me was this, because I've, you know, we've seen each other over many years, although there was the interruption with COVID, but I've known of this project, but I never quite figured out where this fascination with guns was coming from until we sat down more recently and realized it's, it's about guns, but it's really about design. Yeah. And this question of design and what is the role of design, and also I think particularly with Clockwork Basilic, this question of the change from handmade objects to, to mechanically produced objects, to industrialization. And that fits in also within the history of architecture. So I guess my interest both in, in, in what you've done and the incredible research that you've done, which I think is far beyond anything I could imagine even approaching, but that question of design. Right. Um, look, Don, you're from West Texas, a farm. You know about guns. I was using a, uh, a, a firing in a pre pubescent age of 11 uh, at school, uh, 22 rimfire. Uh, and have been fascinated with firearms and war and, war and uh, peace, uh, all of those questions. A little bit like Jesse Reiser, a good <laughs> friend of ours. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a secret yet to be uncovered. <laughs> and, um, you know, in our work of uh, certainly architectural theory, personalities like uh, Charles Eames and the plywood wood, wood uh, leg splint, Paul Virilio, uh, uh, bunker archaeology, mm -hmm. uh, Michelangelo, painter geometer on one hand, military fortress designer on another. I mean, dazzle battleship uh, mm -hmm. by the Cubists in World War I. Uh, it, 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 the list is long with what our education was of making these links between war and peace. And I'm interested in that. Yeah. Um, it, in my projects, uh, Collectman Cell, for example, that was to house uh, uh, my collection of fragments of B-52 bombers, mm -hmm. and I had wanted to get over to uh, the TU-95, and, that, and th that project is about uh, fragments of war. And this is, this is, you went out to Arizona, oh yeah, <laughs> to where they have this huge graveyard yeah. of airplanes, yeah, and they chop off the wings in order yep. to get the aluminum and yep. everything. Yep. Uh, but I, yeah, I forgot about that, which was where the Kleptman and the, the, the various projects of these fragments, sure. these bits and pieces. Sure, sure. And of course my interest in collage, because once you start chopping up a B-52, you get fragments <laughs> that are insane. And so that, so that a, a, a tamed piece of metal, mm. which looks like a widget, you know, yeah. and then a, a, piece of, a piece of a B-52 that's been hit by a 50-ton blade falling 150 foot mm. uh, out of the sky tortured molecules, mm -hmm. that interests me. Yeah, yeah. It's like, why is one way more beautiful than another? Yeah, yeah. Where, where metal is pressed to the absolute out, outer limits. So this question of um, warfare and, and peaceful making, mm -hmm. it's been there well, you know, Yeah, I mean, you, you only have to read the, uh, you know, the seminal book for architects, which is Vitruvius, right. the 10 books of Vitruvius. And right. one of the chapters is about warfare. Right. It's about war machines, yep. and it's about defense against war machines. Right. And then, you know, the great architects of, you know, whether it's Alberti or, uh, 
you know, you know, Christopher Wren. I mean, Christopher Wren is a mathematician yeah. who then gets invited to work with, de, you know, determining ballistics yeah. in terms of cannon fire. Gas and, 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 that was and drawing yeah. up uh, plans for defenses right. for the English, uh, the king. Yeah. And then becomes the greatest architect. Okay, so let me, I know that this is, you're supposed to be interviewing me, but I want to flip it. You're the uh, chair of director of architecture yeah. and design That's at great. this steep uh, university. Mm -hmm. What programs do you teach your students about military culture and warfare? And design. <laughs> He's laughing. Well, let me see. I'm just trying. Not so much a question as a kind of recounting yeah. of somebody who uh, studied architecture. I studied in Houston. You studied in London. We met at Cranbrook, studied together. Then you went to Houston. I went to London. We've both been educators. I've also been able to produce a few buildings and such. Mm -hmm. And then you went down this wormhole of guns instead of architecture, or guns as architecture. Yeah. You've taught classes on it in Chicago and in LA, uh, and you've become obsessed, as you always are, with the projects you've worked on. So I guess what I wanted to try to draw out a little bit is, what was, the, it's not so much about the project and now the book, which is fantastic, but what was this as an educational tool to students? Did students like it? Did students think this is the craziest thing they've ever heard of? Did the school administration yeah. think, why do we have somebody in here teaching guns to our students in the middle of Chicago, which already has its own problem with guns? <laughs> yeah, it does. So what was the role of guns in architectural education? Okay. <clears throat> well, as an educator, um, I have always and still am uh, interested in taboo subjects. Like if, if the academy is not looking at something, whatever it is, for example, I don't know, like crop circles mm. or Jesus or, you know, guns or something like that, inherently it's a good place to go and look and see why the academy refuses to get involved in that. Mm. And um, I actually ran a, 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 a lecture series called Taboo Subjects. Mm. And I would, I would bring you know, people who were really into their subject. And, and, and you really couldn't teach a course on this. So um, firearms, the relationship of war and peace has been long standing. And as we both know, there are great artists who had to, by, by necessity, engage in, in design for warfare. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm doing my little bit here. You know, I've been uh, saddened by the lack of understanding of what firearms uh, culturally mean mm -hmm. uh, and as design mean, and uh, felt that it was necessary to do a course like this uh, in, in a you know hardcore liberal art school, uh, in the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Um, you know that. When I set the project up, the administration were really dodgy. They said they would always support anything that any faculty would do, but there was pushback. And it was only when I was uh, looking for Canaletto uh, in the Art Institute's collection, going through A, B, C, D, C to Canaletto, and I stumbled across Colt 1911 semi-automatic pistol. I thought, oh, why would a, why would a museum have a Colt semi-automatic pistol? in their collection, and yet the school won't let me teach about firearms. I went to the administration and said, by the way, are you aware that the, uh, the uh, Art Institute's got some semi-auto, uh, uh, you know, quite recent weapons? And they thought, oh, fucking bastards have got me. So, <laughs> so we did it. And they were wonderful. And the students? How did the students take it? Did they find it, I mean, as a taboo subject, did they find it intriguing and get involved, or were they even more reserved and yeah. restrained about, yeah. oh, we couldn't possibly talk about guns in the 21st century. Yeah. There were, there were two or three constituencies in the class, and it was maxed out, the class, by the way, open to the whole school, as all classes at the Art Institute are. There was one or two, but not very many, gun nuts in there. They really knew their stuff. Then uh, there were uh, a bunch of people from other countries, non-American countries, 
who no way could they touch a gun in their, their home country. And they had the opportunity to do so. Now, when they show their transcripts back at home, God only knows what will happen, but that's not my problem. <laughs> um, and then there were uh, people who were just curious. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there, as a teacher, there are defining moments where you think, aha, yeah, that was nice. And there was, uh, uh, at the end of the, cl end of the 15 week session, uh, a student who was really frowning. She was really, really frowning. She stood up and said, this class should be taught to every student in this school because I now know at least a little bit about what's really involved with farms. Mm -hmm. And I thought, thank you. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And that's what you did. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, Don. We'll see you soon, and uh, I look forward to our new uh, adventures together. And the book. And the book. <laughs>